All right, here we go. Chapter seven, quadrilaterals and other polygons. This is going to be the first of several geometry units that we cover here in math two. And um, I want to start off as with all these chapters, it's going to be pretty heavy on the key terms and the terminology, how it's used. Um, with geometry, which is a Greek mathematical science, a lot of the key terms are Greek in nature. So um, you're going to see a lot of these terms that kind of share some roots and that sort of thing. The term quadrilateral literally breaks down as four-sided figure. Many of you already know that. The term polygon literally uh, translates as many-sided figure. So this is kind of a generalized umbrella term for any and all uh, number of sided shapes. Quadrilaterals are part of the polygon family. And um, so the important thing to understand here is that the main emphasis of this chapter of this unit is going to be on quadrilaterals. In fact, um, of the five sections in this chapter, the other four after this one are all going to be based around quadra quadrilaterals and specific forms of that and their properties and all that kind of stuff. The other polygon stuff is actually really only explored here in this first section. Okay. So um, in this first section, we're going to talk about specifically angles, one of the two forms of measurement that we're going to explore here in this chapter. Um, the other form being side length, where you can actually literally measure the length of a side, whether it be in uh, centimeters or feet or miles or whatever it might be. Angles will refer to degrees uh, that you can measure with a protractor and that sort of thing. Okay. So... Um, couple things before we jump into the lesson. I want to just kind of hit the highlights here. I just want to sum up some of the um, some of the key terms that we have here uh, on the on the notes that you will see in front of you right now. Um, first off, uh, this chart I have here in the side, uh, I, I said it earlier, just make sure you're writing down the ones that you need. Uh, I would hope that you already know that a three sided figure is called a triangle. Um, some of these other ones you may be familiar with, like eight-sided figures or octagons. Uh, maybe you know that a 10-sided figure is a decagon. Uh, we get that deca uh, prefix used in decade for 10 years, meaning 10. Deca means 10. But anyway, um, some of these you may be less familiar with, particularly things like uh, a seven-sided figure is called a heptagon. Hepta uh, means seven. Okay, um, maybe you didn't know an 11 sided figure was a hen decagon or 12 was do decagon. Okay, these are all Greek in nature, so they have some kind of funky names. It is possible to have more sides than 12. Um, we would just refer to those uh, with the number and then dash gone. For instance, if there was a 94 sided figure, we would just call it a 94 gone. Gone, the Greek word for sides or number of sides. OK, uh, it's also impossible to have a um, geometric shape with fewer than three sides, um, two sides. It's impossible to connect them in any way uh, to, to make a shape, at least straight sides. You would have to curve one of them and make kind of lens shape um, and obviously impossible to have a one sided figure. Some people argue that a circle is a one sided figure. Uh, but again, when we talk about sides or polygons, we're referring to actual straight line segments. So um, the smallest number of sides we can have with straight line segments would be a triangle. Okay, uh, the next set of terms I want to just point out because you're going to see them. Uh, you're not going to be tested on these terms or anything like that. These are just things I want to point out because you're going to see them and maybe confusing what they mean. Convex versus concave. Um, for those that wear glasses or have contact lenses. You may be familiar with these terms already. Um, convex refers to the fact that in polygons, all of the corners of a given shape, all of the corners of a given shape are pointed outward from the center. So all four of these polygons shown here are what we call convex polygons. We're, we're going to be dealing exclusively with convex polygons. They're, they uh, will be the more familiar version of shapes. The crazier looking ones like these guys are called concave because at least one corner of each shape is caved in somewhere. Okay. From a lens perspective, for those that were curious uh, that wear glasses or contact lenses, convex would mean that the curved lenses 
uh, bow outward from the center of the lens. For instance, concave lenses uh, would look like this. Sorry, not concave, convex lenses would look like that, where like uh, you'd have this bowed out lensing part. It has to do with whether it's nearsighted or farsighted, uh, whereas concave lenses would bow inward and they would look more like this with uh, those curved sets. Okay, where it would, the lens would curve inward. Okay, again, dealing with near versus far sided. Again, you're not going to be tested on those parts. These are not polygons over here because they involve curves. Uh, we're going to be dealing with straight line segment polygons being many sided figures. Okay, so back to this section. The one and only formula that we're going to be dealing with in this section is this one right here. And it refers to adding up the angles on the inside or on the interior of a given polygon. Okay, so when it came to these shapes, we're going to have different classifications of shapes based on these names. The term classification refers to a category. Okay, for instance, all three sided figures are what we call triangles. So again, here's where we see the abstract nature of geometry. It's very tempting to just look at this triangle and be like, all right, I'm talking about this specific triangle. Okay, but the important thing to understand here with geometry is that when I'm talking about these rules from like interior angles for this convex triangle, this convex three sided figure, it doesn't just apply to this specific one you see here on the screen. It refers to all triangles, however crazy they may look. All three sided figures are going to follow this rule. And that's that uh, if I were to add up the interior angles here and in a triangle, there are three interior angles. Okay. Those three interior angles, if I were to measure them and add them together, would have to have a very specific result. Regardless of whatever crazy triangle you were to come up with in your mind, it would have the same result as this one here on the page. And it would use this formula. So uh, N in this formula refers to the number of sides. So in a three-sided triangle, N would equal three. And so three minus two is one. That one times 180 tells me that if I were to add up the three angles inside of this triangle, they would have to add up to or sum total to get 180 degrees. And that's for every triangle, not just the one you see here on the paper. For this guy, this is a four-sided figure. And this four-sided figure would be what we call a quadrilateral, right? Um, there are subcategories of quadrilaterals. For instance, this could also be considered a rhombus or a parallelogram. Uh, but in any case, this is a four-sided quadrilateral. So again, the abstract nature of geometry, it's very tempted to just think about what you see here on the paper. But when I talk about quadrilaterals, I'm talking also about squares, rectangles, trapezoids, anything with four sides, this rule has to apply to it. So for a four-sided figure, n would be four. Four minus two would be two. That two times 180 degrees would give me 360 degrees. Whatever four-sided figure you're, you come up with, however crazy it may look, all four angles would have to add up to make 360 degrees. And the same types of rules could apply to eight-sided figures or octagons or six-sided figures, hexagons, okay? These just happen to be the ones that I drew to represent it, okay? As long as it's convex, as long as it's convex, in other words, all the corners point outward from the center of the shape, then the interior angles have to add up to a specific number determined by this formula, okay? So... In your assignment, how would you be asked questions about this? Um, the simplest way you would be asked questions about is you'd simply be given a physical shape like one of these. Like they might point to this guy and be like, all right, determine the interior angle sum of this shape right here. Well, you might first count the number of sides that exist there, and you'd find that this is an eight-sided octagon. And so you would say like, all right, well, if it's eight sides, I would plug in eight for N. Eight minus two is six. That six times 180 would give me 1,080 degrees. Don't feel like you have to do that in your head. Use a calculator. But that would mean that this octagon and 
any convex oct octagon would also have to have an interior angle sum of 1080 degrees. Uh, you might also be given the actual classification name. So for instance, they might say like, all right, well, a seven-sided heptagon you are given uh, determine the interior angle sum. In that case, you would say like, all right, well, a heptagon refers to seven sides, n would be seven, and you would go through the solution process right there. Okay, so that's the, kind of the easy way. You would just directly plug it into that relatively simple formula. The other way it could be asked would be like this. This is a little less straightforward, but it's still kind of an easy process to solve for. All right, so in this problem, in this example, we're given the following question. A polygon, which is, again, a very general term that's not a specific number of sides. Poly just means many-sided, or, or, or sorry, poly just means many, and the gon part just means sided. So um, some many-sided figure, all of these are polygons. So it could be any of those or more. A polygon has an interior angle sum of 900 degrees. Based on that number, classify the polygon. So what does classify mean? It means literally give it a name, categorize it, right? Is it a triangle? Is it a decagon? Is it a pentagon, right? You need to determine which of the names it's going to get based on that piece of information. So let's jump to the whiteboard. All right, so we're going to be using this formula, n minus 2 times 180, where n refers to the number of sides of a given polygon. And whatever happens in this formula, it's going to result in some total interior angle sum. If I were to add up all the angles inside whatever figure I was given. In this example, instead of being given the number of sides, I'm given what the result is. In this case, 900 degrees. So I'm basically given the other variable in this formula. Okay, and now what my job is to do is to classify the figure. Well, in order to classify that figure, I need to know how many number of sides it has. So in other words, my job here is to solve for n. So I need to solve for n by moving this minus 2 and this multiplied 180 degrees. So just like any other inverse set of operations with algebra, I'm going to move this 180 through division because it's being multiplied. So I divide both sides by that 180 degrees. And when I divide 900 by 180 on a calculator, I would get 5. And then on the left-hand side, that 180 would cancel, and I'd be left with just my parentheses. I actually don't even need to write the parentheses anymore. I would just have n minus 2 equals 5. And in order to move that minus 2, I'd do the inverse operation, which is to add 2. Many of you probably wouldn't even have to do that part. But you would find out that n equals 5 plus 2, or 7. Well, great. So what does that 7 mean? n, again, refers to the number of sides of a given figure. What we have literally done is that some interior angle sum equals 900 degrees. Based on that result, we know that whatever shape this is, it has to have seven sides. And so how do I classify it or categorize it or name it based on that? I could refer back to the chart that's in the notes, and I would find that it is given the name of heptagon. Hepta referring to, in Greek, seven. Gon referring to number of sides. So this is what we would call a heptagon. Be prepared for either of these results in big ideas. It may ask you to actually give the name of the shape, or it may just ask you to solve for n. In either case, it's that the same formula, same result. That's about as tricky as that kind of problem gets. Great. Let's move on. <clears throat> So back to the notes, I wanted to talk about this little piece here in the middle. Okay, um, this is what we would call a corollary in math. Um, basically, this is the main theorem. And this refers to any number of sides of a given polygon. A corollary might say like, all right, well, specifically for, say, a four-sided quadrilateral, 
what would my sum total be? Because now I'm only talking about four-sided figures. And so the quadrilateral interior angle sum refers to only four-sided figures. So in that case, N would only be four. And so if I plug four in, four minus two is two. That two times 180 degrees means that any and all four-sided figures must have an interior angle sum of 360 degrees. Whatever four-sided figure I come up with, if I were to add up all four interior angles, whatever they were, they'd have to add up to 360. And so uh, that's what we would call a corollary because it's based off of a bigger umbrella theorem. And so you'll see problems like this where you may be given a quadrilateral, like in this case, or maybe you're given an octagon or hexagon. You just have to determine what your sum total has to be based on that shape. But in this four-sided quadrilateral, I know it has to total up to 360. So if I was asked to say solve for X here, I would add up each of these four angles, whatever they were. In this case, X plus 108 plus 121 plus 59. And whatever that was all together, it would have to equal 360. Be prepared that in some of these problems, you may see variables in multiple locations of the, of the given corners. Okay, just again, it simply breaks down to add up each of the angles and it has to equal the sum total of that shape. So if you had variables in multiple places, just combine like terms of those variables and you solve it like regular algebra at that point. Okay, all right, let's keep moving forward. <clears throat> Next thing I wanted to show you was down here in the margin. Okay. This one is also tricky because they don't give us a lot of information. So over here in the margin, we're given this, what looks like home plate in baseball or softball. Okay, this shape, this five-sided figure, also called a pentagon. So we're given this five-sided figure and we're asked to find the measurement of angle C. So just to get you used to this geometric um, notation right here, that little m refers to measurement, so it's an actual like degree result we'll get. And that little wedge piece right there is just a symbol for angle. So it's the measurement of angle C in this case. In other words, they're asking us to identify how many degrees this angle right here is. Okay. And you'll notice they actually don't tell us very much information with the shape. We can tell that's a five-sided figure. And we're given these little symbols in each of these angle corners, right? We see these little boxes for A, B, and down here in D. And then we see these little arches for E and C. Beyond that, that's all the information we're given here. And we have to determine the exact measurement of this angle. So let me jump to the whiteboard. All right. Again, we're given the following figure. Again, what looks like home plate in baseball or softball. And then they tell us they've given names to each of these corners as follows. And then we're also given these symbols in the corners. We're told that each of these corners, A, B, and D, are given those boxes. Now, hopefully you recall this from previous math lessons and stuff, but this box actually has a specific meaning. It refers to the fact that this is what we call a right angle, meaning that it equals exactly 90 degrees. And all three of these boxes that we are given have to share the same measurement. So we are given some stuff. It just wasn't explicitly written. The other piece of information we're given are these little arches. Again, hopefully from geometry, you remember this piece of information, that these arches refer to what's called congruence. In other words, whatever specific angle measurement exists here for angle C, it must also match and equal what is over here in angle E. So however crazy degree this may be, it could be weird decimals or fractions, whatever it is, I'm just going to copy and paste it over here to angle C. The other thing to understand here is that because it's an arch and not this box is that means it's not necessarily 90 degrees. So I can't just copy and paste 90 all the way around. In fact, I would not be allowed to for the following reason. 
we're going to apply the formula that we got at the beginning of these notes, this beginning of this section. So we're given this interior angle sum theorem, n minus 2 times 180 degrees, where n refers to the number of sides of a given figure. So if I wanted to add up all these angles, whatever they were, it would have to equal some specific sum total. <clears throat> and that's determined by this formula. Well, there are five sides, meaning that N here has to be five. It's a pentagon. And so doing the math, five minus two would be three. That three, I'm going to multiply it by that 180 degrees. And that's going to equal, in this case, just do it on a calculator. Don't feel like you have to do it in the head. 540 degrees. So what? What does that 540 degrees mean? It means whatever values are in each of these angles, if I were to add all five of them together, no matter what they were, they would have to add to 540. That is required. Okay, that's a rule. It's a law. Okay. Well, I still need to solve for this specific one. So how can I use this information to, with this information to solve what I need? In this case, I'm simply just going around the figure and adding up the pieces I know and solving for the pieces I don't. Well, I know three of the specific measurements here, and that's that three of the angles are 90. So I can add up three 90s together. The two that I don't know are angle E and angle C. Measurement of angle E plus the measurement of angle C. So I have five different angles here. Three of them I know because there was a box there. But if I were to add up these five angles, they would have to total 540 degrees. Well, I can actually combine these guys together. So 90 plus 90 plus 90 would give me 270 degrees. And I'm going to do a little trick here. Angle E and angle C, because they are congruent, given by these arches, another way to think about it is that I could just take this angle C and double it, since it's going to be the exact same as angle E. So a little trick here would be to just simply write angle E and angle C as two times the measurement of angle C, or E for that matter. But either way, if I were to add up these two things now, they would have to equal in total 540 degrees still because it's still a five-sided figure. So how do I keep going? Well, now I can do some actual algebra. I can move this 270 to the other side by subtraction. So on the left, I'd be left with this two times the measurement of angle C. And if I subtract 270 from 540 on a calculator, I would get the result of 270 again. You can double check that, but 540 minus that 270 gets me right back to 270. And now if I want to get the actual specific of angle C, I need to divide both sides by that 2. And so over here on the left, I'd be left with just measurement of angle C, with the very thing I need to solve for. And 270 divided by 2 gives me 135 degrees. This ends up being my final answer. And I can actually confirm that this is the correct answer by plugging it back into my original shape. So if angle C is in fact 135 degrees, let's double check that work. Well, if angle C is 135, because angle E is congruent, this must also be 135 degrees. So now I'd have 90, 90, 135, 90, and 135. Based on this interior angles rule, I should be able to add all of those five angles back together to get to 540. So let's confirm that 90 plus 90 plus 90 is in fact three times 90 or 270. 135 and 135 is also 270. That 270 plus 270 gives me 540. So this works out. Had I gotten anything other than 135, it would not have equaled that sum total for the interior angles. So that's how you can go about that kind of problem. Not bad considering we were given very limited information. All right, just a couple more things to show you in the notes. <clears throat> the next thing I wanted to do is I just want to talk about um, a couple of key terms. 
And one last little theorem, technically. Move this around a bit. Okay. So I wanted to point out a couple key terms right here. Uh, we're going to see each of these in the next couple of chapters. So I wanted to kind of break them down. Again, we're going to see some Greek uh, here in the, in the naming of these things. Um, the first of which I want to point out is the term equilateral. You're going to hear about equilateral polygons. Again, polygon just refers to some shape, okay? A shape with straight edge sides, okay? So equilateral literally means equal side length. Okay, equal side length. And I wanted to point out this little geometric visualization right here, these little dash marks. Hopefully you recall that these mean congruence for side length. So if you were actually to take out a ruler and measure the side of one of these sides of this hexagon that we're given, each of these six sides would each be the same length. That's what we would call equilateral. And this one happens to be a hexagon. You could also do the same for a triangle or a decagon, so on and so forth. Equilateral. Equiangular means that literally breaks down as equal angle measurements. So that's kind of what we dealt with in this section. So again, here you see a hexagon, a six-sided figure. Equiangular says, tells me nothing about the side lengths of this hexagon. Instead, it simply tells me that all six of the interior angles have to be congruent to each other. How could that be used? I could tell you you're given an equiangular hexagon like you see here, and you may simply be asked, all right, determine the measurement of that specific angle in that corner right there. How'd you go about doing that? Well, based on the interior angle sum theorem that we learned at the beginning of this section, I could learn that a six-sided figure plugging into that n minus two times 180 would give me, um, let's see, six minus two is four, four times 180 would be 720 degrees. So the fact that it's a hexagon means that whatever these angles are, they have to add up to 720. The fact that in an equiangular hexagon, they all have to be the same, I could simply divide by six to find out that each of these individual angles has to be 120 degrees. Okay, that's how you could use it there, equiangular. The other term you're gonna see is this one, regular polygons. In this case, a regular hexagon. The term regular refers to the fact that it's gonna be both these things at once. In other words, all sides of the polygon are gonna be congruent to each other, all interior angles are going to be congruent to each other. So in a hexagon, all six sides would be congruent to each other. They'd have the same side length. And all six interior angles would, in that case, measure 120 degrees. Okay. So just be prepared that you'll see these terms, and that's what they mean. I'll make sure I point them out when we come across them. All right. One last little item to mention. That's down here. So at the beginning of these notes, we talked about interior or inside angles. Here we're going to talk about exterior or outside angles. And these ones will be pretty distinguishable because you're going to get a crazy looking shape that looks something like this with these little kind of spiral looking things coming off of it. Basically what happens is this. If you were to take any of the one sides of a given polygon and extend it past the corner, you fundamentally create an exterior angle, an angle that's outside of the given shape, right? And if you were to do that to each of the sides, you'd end up with the same number of exterior angles. Now, the reason why I don't really offer an example here is because there isn't a formula for this one. It's just always going to be the same thing, regardless of how many sides there are, whether it's six, like this given weird looking hexagon here, or if it was lots more like a dodecagon, a 12 sided figure, or it was a lot less like a triangle. Okay. However many sides there are, I would take all of the exterior angles, in this case, six, no matter what shape you are given, all of the exterior angles will always have to sum up together, add up together to make 360 degrees. So for instance, in this example, if you were given this and you were asked to solve for the variable X, this guy right there, uh, I would simply add up each of these six angles together, whatever was there, combining any like terms, and setting it equal to 360. Move stuff away from the variable as usual, and you can solve for the variable that way. And again, that one is universal, so 
this one happened to have six exterior angles. There may be uh, a triangle that only has three exterior angles. All three together would have to add up to make 360. Or it could have lots more, like a dodecagon. There could be 12 exterior, exterior angles. And all 12 would have to add up together to make 360. That one is universal. Okay. And that ends our section one notes. So let me go ahead and stop recording.